I've done multiple videos about tropes and trends, and this need to discuss patterns and their pitfalls is somewhat self-inflicted. Consuming video games on a daily basis through an overwhelming collection that can't possibly be completed means it's easy to witness the beats of a story or pacing of a level and notice similarities across a vast selection of games. In this jaded mindset, it might explain why Hellblade and A Way Out intrigued me. Even their elevator pitch was unexpected and didn't follow tradition to a T. My frame of reference for these games wasn't nearly as extensive as, say, The Order. Innovation and creativity is always important. Without it, we never move past the simulations of tennis racing and missile attacks. But despite a tendency to roll my eyes when watching a trailer or reading a Steam page, ultimately, I try to give everything the chance to surprise me. Because anything can. And that's what this video's about. Games with premises that on paper don't hold merit, but in practice or through skilled execution, are better than I expected. Possibly one of the most underwhelming names in video games, and one that easily gets you overwritten in Google searches. Not that Sega's lack of marketing made that matter. The club's premise is eight characters are pulled into, well, the club, an underground blood sport made by a wealthy psychopath that has fellow elites placing bets on the contestants. You play as one of the eight characters with the goal of completing every level with the highest score possible. Taking the kudos system from Project Gotham Racing and applying it to shooters, the game ignores its competition's focus on cover and story, in favor of the arcade sensibilities of PGR, Tony Hawk, and beat-em-ups. This surface-level appraisal is what likely turns so many off the game to begin with. Achieving the high score might have been an acceptable premise in the arcade, but for a $60 game on a $300 console in 2008, people had come to expect more than a racing game with guns, and presentation fails to elevate the concept. Despite touring the world, every level takes place in a motley of concrete, brick, and rust. Sound effects are less impactful than Quake, and the music's a forgettable collection of brooding electronica. That last part hurts because its main theme was composed by Jesper Kidd, one of gaming's treasures behind the score of Hitman and Assassin's Creed, while the score itself was done by Richard Jack, who assisted with Mass Effect. But tracks don't have the punch of their industrial inspirations. It's a game that desperately pleads for KMFDM or Frontline Assembly. The gameplay was developed before its characters and world were even conceived of, and it shows. The club is never explained in detail, participants are given the thinnest of characterization, and introductions to each of the eight stages are suspiciously vague. An event taking place in the streets of one of America's largest cities, without anyone outside of the club knowing anything about it. So, a premise without method on paper and less presentation than PowerPoint. What's the club doing here then? Well, I asked a similar question of why did I buy this game for $3 at EB, and I learned the answer after completion, feeling compelled to purchase a second copy for PC. The club is almost certainly a proof of concept, but one that I find oddly compelling. That may stem from growing up on the genre Bizarre took the most inspiration from. Action games have used combo systems before. Shooters have featured arcade modes, but said arcades are bonuses, not something the game is designed with from the start. That's where the club separates itself from other shooters, using linear levels not to ensure that you don't lose track of the story or set pieces, but to encourage one to maximize their ability. In the same way that anyone can take a Ferrari around a circuit in Project Gotham, anyone can complete a stage in the club. The real game is in chaining together combos and the satisfaction of realizing your intent without any luck. What I've always adored about racing games is their unrelenting pressure, the excitement of consistently making a four-wheel machine scream bloody murder, for if you don't, someone else will. And that's what the club effectively captures. You must aim for headshots, score multi-kills, and sprint from checkpoint to checkpoint, for any second wasted is going to stop you from topping the charts. What's more impressive is how the game's context remedies its own issues. The AI blindly charges you, as with most shooters. But were the game to have intelligent and cautious AI, it potentially damaged its flow. Forcing you to hunt down targets when already dealing with the pressure of chaining them together is just cruel. Its abundance of stupid enemies charging you is enjoyable due to needing to make the most of it, unlike a more serious effort such as Battlefield 1, whose AI contradicts the realistic visuals and the gameplay only requires you to survive each encounter. The absurdity of the structure here allows the equally absurd battles to feel natural. Being someone that lacked any interest in the arcade modes to my favorite shooters, the club is one of the biggest surprises I've had in a while, but I don't expect many to share my enthusiasm. This game has a lot of basic faults that are due to its technology and design. For instance, in games like Trackmania or Trials, you press a single button for restarting a stage, and it's a large part of what makes those games so addicting, 
because erasing the mistakes you've made or trying to make that failed jump is only one click away. Here, the amount of AI indestructibles and levels means that the game can't use this feature. So the only way to restart is to wait until you've reached the end, check if you're first, and if not, manually pause the game and restart there. It's overly cumbersome, as are the hidden areas which break your combos and secrets that only exist for achievements. The club is an MVP, a minimal viable product, when it has the potential to be so much more. I imagine a successor with the charisma and style of Hotline Miami, Doom, or Burnout, employing elements that exist beyond the immediate gunplay. Basket in gore, lore, and locations that don't amount to abandoned factories. You could add spectators, character-specific narratives, or a licensed soundtrack. By no means is this game for everyone, but if what you've seen has piqued your interest, copies of it are dirt cheap these days. And I think it serves as an example of a game whose premise doesn't click on paper, but in hand. Now, what about a game whose premise is stale regardless of context? Iron Sight is self-described as a futuristic military FPS based on the battle over natural resources in 2025 between private military co <laughs> The first of its kind, Iron Sight combines realistic FPS gameplay with an arsenal of combat arms which includes innovative and technologically advanced artillery and combat skills. Let's cut to the chase. It's Black Ops 2 with a peppering of Infinity Ward's output. Supporting an engine custom built to replicate the look, speed, physics, and feel of Call of Duty during the 7 console generation, it's one of the most shamelessly blatant copies I've ever experienced. Free-to-play shooters have been echoing Call of Duty's design since Modern Warfare, but only superficially. A game like Battle Territory Battery wears its inspiration on its sleeve, but while the setup is a repeat of COD 4, the design inputs and level design meet the standards of free-to-play shooters, not the game it's based on. Iron Sight recreates the perks, killstreaks, map designs, customization, weapons, sprinting, reload speed, ADS time, and even the knife animations. This game could be titled Call of Duty Online, and no one would question it. And that's what makes Iron Sight stand out from the crowd. It's a quality recreation, akin to the rare song cover that's as good as the original. Rarer, in fact, because Iron Sight doesn't just copy Call of Duty's peak, but improves upon it. Nearly all of my complaints with Call of Duty's multiplayer have been addressed with this game. Hipfire is usable, encouraging people to run and gun rather than camp with one-tap assault rifles. Perks and killstreaks are reserved rather than cluttered, and levels offer multiple pathways with exclusive features. This is what's most reminiscent of the Black Ops series, with map-specific events or devices. Dam features platforms that can transport you across the level without moving yourself, and adjustable ramps that grant or deny access to a route. Outpost has a sandstorm, reducing visibility and creating a new pathway for people in and outside its central complex. Airport's got a conveyor belt, and my favorite, Oceanfront, has a ship that arrives in the middle, removing containers as the match progresses. Gimmicks vary in significance, but they're what help the levels create an atmosphere or sense of life, rather than the three-lane shooting galleries we're used to. This improvement even extends to health. At first I wondered why this game decided to make health regenerate slowly when it copied so much else, but I eventually realized what it's for. It's meant to prevent the SMG charging rampages that have plagued Call of Duty for years. It's easy for even a mid-tier player to enter a public lobby, pick up the MP40, UMP, or 74U, camp spawn, and get your but here, anyone who lost a firefight to you is going to know you're barely alive and will likely hunt you down before you reset. That only encourages people to use the flanking routes available and elevate the experience beyond its point-and-shoot foundation. Not to discredit said foundation, the shooting in this game is fantastic, with impressive sound design that gives every weapon a distinct punch, especially with sniper rifles. Even this game's progression system is relatively generous. Weapons, in my experience, are pretty balanced with basic loadouts being more than exceptional, and there's nothing as obnoxious as what I previously mentioned. Credits are given frequently, and each level grants you a case that can include attachments, weapons, or cosmetics. And weapons are owned permanently. Kind of. Being free to play, there's gotta be a catch somewhere, and that's your weapons degrade over time. To my knowledge, they don't become weaker in gameplay, but the more you use a weapon, the higher your repair cost will be. If you pay attention to your loadouts, they can be repaired cheaply, but forget about it, and you can be paying roughly the same amount as a new gun. Personally, I don't have an issue with the system itself, only that it's not explained clearly to players, and there isn't an immediate option to remove it through cash payments. One thing I wish this game did borrow from other free-to-play shooters is the ability to test weapons on a firing range before purchasing them. It should be a standard, and Ironsight's lack of it is questionable. 
But honestly, other than those nitpicks and a bizarre bug that I had to bypass with an alternate account, my only criticism with this game is its lack of maps. Which is because it's a recent beta, and it's also something the developers are already addressing with content in the future. Being someone who always enjoyed Call of Duty's multiplayer for the laid-back satisfaction it can be, Iron Sight's exactly what I wanted from this unoriginal idea. It's easy to write this game off on paper and from its poor execution by other developers, but Whipple Games clearly did their homework, and their effort and talent clearly shows when you play, and it's only more impressive upon learning that this is their debut. Now, the last free-to-play game I discussed has since been canned. This is a genre that's always evolving, and perhaps the future of this game will enter a downward spiral, but I hope for the best, especially as I believe that there's a greater reason behind this game's existence. Call of Duty Online has existed since 2013, but only in China. Raven Software developed the free-to-play title for Asia's gaming market in partnership with Tencent, one of the most prevalent investment companies out there. And since 2016, Activision has been looking to bring this game to the West, but there's many challenges. The game itself has been in open beta for three years. It'd need to be altered drastically to revert its microtransactions made for a market that vastly differs from North America, and it's published by Activision and Tencent meaning it's unlikely to be managed by people who give a damn about you, the consumer. I believe online still hasn't made a big push in the West due to Call of Duty's continued success. When your core consumer base is happily eating up each release in DLC pack, a free alternative is only going to be released for a market that demands it, hence it being a Chinese exclusive as of recording. But Activision's left the door open as a result, one that Iron Sight's gone through, doing what Call of Duty does with better design, focus, and support. Moving players to online is going to be a much tougher proposition when gamers have already grown accustomed to its superior alternative. Clichés and unoriginality aren't necessarily a problem as long as quality is involved. And that's what Iron Sight understands. In the 90s and early 2000s, futuristic arcade racers were everywhere. Arcades, consoles, and computers powered beastly machines across water, land, or space. The pixelated joys of Jet Moto, F-Zero, and Wipeout were hard to escape. But the racing genre is a niche that's only narrowed in prevalence over the years. To producers, there's nothing in the market to continue the production of these franchises, no matter the nostalgia or significance of certain entries. There was a time when pitching an anti-gravity racer influenced by F-Zero and Wipeout would have met with a sigh of fatigued gamers. But 20 years later, on a platform without a worthy successor, this old idea is new again. I didn't grow up with Redout's influences. Gran Turismo and Codemasters dominated my childhood. But that only made its execution more impressive. To renew a formula untouched by most for two decades and feel fresh is a testament to the strength of high-octane arcade racers, and how well the subgenre lends itself to video games. Vehicles can travel at much higher speeds than automobiles. The lack of realism means that racetracks aren't wide and merciful towards accidents. They're eerily tight and make 500 miles an hour feel like a thousand. Horses can teleport you across the land and combine portions of each track. Every element lends itself to the immediate drama and excitement of Redout's races. It even has a cockpit mode to immerse you directly in the hot seat. But the greatest enhancement Redout brings to this resurrection is the fidelity. I'm not one to care about texture quality, as you'll witness in just a moment. But not only is Redout achingly beautiful, its usage of modern technology assists in its gameplay. Locations aren't filled with pixelated concrete, but palm trees, snow, canyons, and vast forests that give a sense of scale to your speed. Chromatic aberration and motion blur effects are crisp, and believable physics give the wonderful danger of thrusting over a gap. To nitpick, engines could be a bit more intense, and landing on the ground should be met with a metal clash to really make your vehicles feel like a hypercharged monster of metal. But, that last decision is made for gameplay reasons. As that crash sound is meant to indicate damage taken, and were to occur upon landing, it potentially misinformed players. Other than that, all that's missing is a proper custom soundtrack feature. But alt-tabbing will have to do for now, in regards to our need for specifics. There's one more game, however, that will lead into my conclusion. Just hear me out first. This video is about games that are better than I expected, meaning that while Phantom Forces may not be good, it's in a far better place in the browser battlefields I hold so dearly. Rasterworks and Assault Cube are what I played on library computers, so to think their modern day equivalent has movement this rapid and responsive, with weapons punchier than many dedicated shooters, makes me envy these young players. Because vaulting through a window and aiming down sights to mow down a squad of enemies is just as satisfying here as most shooters. The noticeable but controllable recoil and roaring gunfire makes every shot count, 
whether they're single fire or fully automatic. And the silly player models of Roblox lend themselves to distinct hitboxes that don't feel unreliable. Making a shooter for this sandbox platform is only more impressive when comparing it to the Minecraft-inspired voxel shooters like Block and Load and Murder Miners. Games where the limitations of movement, animation, and sound is felt in the action-packed scenarios they create. Whereas Phantom Force's immediate inputs don't feel lacking or limited. It's as visceral and quick as its inspirations. Roblox's limitations appear elsewhere, such as the map design and ANSI cheat systems. There's no reason for hardcore players to dump their hours onto this game, just as there was no reason for Quake fans to install Assault Cube. But for players who will likely become the hardcore gamers of the future, I can see the engagement of Phantom Forces, and even respect its abundant progression system that'll engage players beyond the immediate systems. I've poked fun at browser games like most have, but truthfully, there's a beauty to the Robloxes and RuneScapes of the world, when children aren't spending their parents' money on them. They allow almost anybody to see what makes video games a distinctly different medium, and engage with experiences and people that'll lead to viewing them as more than entertainment, but influential and important to their lives. In making this video, I stumbled upon a great quote by one of the makers of the club. When asked why the game didn't sell, he replied, you can't put gameplay on the back of the box. The quote's usage can be debated. There were multiple reasons why the club didn't find an audience. Its lack of presentation and marketing come to mind. But that doesn't diminish the truth in his words and how they apply to this art form. Anything can be simplified to the point of contempt, sometimes by the game's publicity itself, and sometimes our doubts and fears come to fruition, making it easy to see red in what we love. But you'll never know what a game truly is until you've experienced it. And that inability to know is what will always bring me back for more. Will we get a video on Alan Wake to close the Remedy Circle? Maybe. Fuck, Mary kill. Sparky, Sparky, Sparky. All of them simultaneously. Is anything truly real? No. Is it hip to fuck bees? With the amount that I'm out of the loop on things, probably. When are you gonna let Sparky run the channel? Ten minutes before the asteroid crashes into Earth. What's your thought on the concert of Vienna? More specifically, should we dig Kaiser Wilhelm II out of his grave and name him sole emperor of the European Union? I am so lost right now. Will you ever make a video on the Metroid Prime trilogy in time for Prime 4's release? If I ever do, it probably won't be years later as I didn't grow up with the series. But I'm looking forward to playing through the trilogy as it's something I've been meaning to cross off my list for some time. Are you going to put, I used to work at EA in your Twitter profile since you always bring it up in chats? But then I wouldn't have a reason to bring it up in chats. What is love? Your Patreon money. <laughs>